Oh, good. So Frank Wagner, you're out there. Is that correct? I'm out here somewhere, Marshall. You just That's have to hunt and peck to find me. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have, uh, let's see, I have one minor concern. We're going to wait and get started for about three or four minutes just to let people filter in. Uh, I, I had no idea how many people would come. So right now we're at 308. So uh, hopefully we won't go over a thousand because that's when the uh, that's when the Zoom calls start kicking out. So I think I've got up to a thousand on the call. So we should be in good shape. Uh, so I'm looking forward to talking to everybody. It's a new life. So uh, oh, let's see what time is it now. Let's give it just a couple of minutes. It sounds like we have people from many, many countries. Uh, you know, Kate, it'll be interesting to know how many people from different countries are here. My guess is we have at least 30 or so. So it's a very, very large sample. Uh, in my survey of all the people, is Linda Sharkey here? Not yet, perhaps. Okay. Yes, Linda. I'm here, Marsha. Oh, hi, Linda. How you doing? Hi, Marsha. <laughs> I was just on mute. <laughs> okay, I got Linda Sharkey here. She's going to be describing one of these processes that we're going through. I've got Frank is here. And Brandon is here. Is that correct, Frank? Uh, I'm not sure. Brandon, are you on? If you come off mute, yep. let us know you're here. I'm here. Good morning, everyone from Portland, Oregon. Oh, very good. Very good. Well, let's go ahead and we can go ahead and get started. People are still filtering in. So getting started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Big round of applause for everyone. Yay. So welcome to everyone. It's a joy to talk with you. So getting started, I'm going to be playing more of a role in stakeholder-centered coaching. Will is left to start a new business, which is just fine. One of the things I tell everyone I coach is, you know, it's, don't stay forever. So he was there for nine years. He did a fine job. He's off to start his own business, which is, you know, that's fine. Now I'm going to get more involved. So the timing on this for me is actually good. It's a great time in my life to get more involved because I have 11 million people <laughs> flyer miles. So for years I spent traveling around the world and I can't do that anymore. So let me give you just my overall goal of life. Then we're going to start in on the new stuff. So what I'm going to do is we're going to spend about 30 to 40 minutes on content of not administrative things, but new coaching things. Because I want to have calls maybe once, maybe once a, every week or so, where I go over new ideas in coaching. We can all discuss those. Before we get into the new content, in time, so just a little overview. So we spent 30 to 40 minutes on content. Then we're going to spend another 20 or 30 minutes on administrative stuff because there's all kinds of questions about the new system and how's it going to work and everything. So we'll spend a few minutes on that as well so everybody gets oriented to that. So we'll do the content part first. Therefore, people that really are not interested in the administrative part, you can check out and the people that have administrative questions about the new system and how it's going to work. Kate, Kate, can you hit all the mute button? Yeah, yeah. So we'll have uh, we'll have time for everybody to talk about that or in the administrative part. All right. Let me just start with an overview. Uh, in life, I'm getting older, so my basic mission is to give back as much as I can to as many people as I can. And so what's happened is we have the 100 Coaches program that's doing that. And I think stakeholder coaching is a good opportunity to give you as much as I can since you've already invested in us. So look at this as an opportunity that I'm going to share as much as I can with you. If you have questions, use it. Now, all the material that I'm going to teach you, use in any way you want to use. Now, Will's starting a new business. There was a little confusion because he did this website thing. If you want any of you use his material, go ahead. I'm a believer that you should do anything you want to do. So use any material you want to use. So if, if he's got any new material that's good for you and you want to use it, use it. That's just fine. That's just fine. Now, 
I'm going to start with the new material that I'm working on. For some of you, part of this may be a review. Then I'm going to connect it to the new things I'm doing. One of the things that I've been working on over the years is called daily questions. And the daily question process is incredibly effective, yet incredibly difficult to do. This is something I've been doing for about 25 years. It works. It will help you get better at almost anything. It costs nothing. And people are skeptical. Help me get better at anything. Costs nothing. Uh, takes three minutes a day. How can this be possible? Half the people that start doing this quit within two weeks. And they do not quit because it does not work. They quit because it does work. So this is very easy to understand, yet very, very difficult to do. I have someone call me on the phone every day where we go through my own questions. And this person has varied over the years, but right now my friend Mark Thompson calls me every day. We review our daily questions together. Now someone asks me, why do you have someone call you on the phone every day? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. That's why I have someone call me on the phone every day. The reason I do this, uh, my, na my name is Marshall Goldsmith. I have someone call me on the phone every day. Why? I'm too cowardly to do this by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this by myself, and I need help. And, and it's okay. So once we get over that kind of macho, I can do everything on my own nonsense, life is better for everybody. Now, how does the daily questions work? One, you get out a spreadsheet. On one column, you write down a series of questions which represents what's most important in your life. It could be friends, it could be families, it could be your direct reports, it could be coworkers. Every question has to be answered with yes and no or a number. Seven boxes across, one for every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. At the end of the week, you get a report card. And I will warn all of you in advance, the report card at the end of the week will not be as beautiful as a corporate values plaque you see stuck up on the wall. I've been doing this for years. And when you do this every day, you quickly learn that life, life is incredibly easy to talk. And life is incredibly difficult to live. Now, I'm going to give you all of my daily questions. Uh, don't send me an email yet, but I'm going to give you my email address is marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. At the end of this session, if you want the article summarizing everything, send me an email at the end. And we'll send you some articles uh, connecting everything I just taught you. Marshall with two L's at marshallgoldsmith.com. Now, one of my daily questions is, how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it wasn't worth it? Well, you know, it's kind of hard for the old professor not to be right all the time. I don't see too many zeros on that scorecard. Uh, how many angry or destructive comments did you make about people yesterday? Well, again, I don't see enough zeros on that one either. We don't want other people to say bad things about us. Why do we say bad things about them? Uh, how many minutes did I walk? How many push-ups? How many sit-ups? Did I say or do something nice for my wife, my son, my daughter, my grandchildren? Just questions about life. I've been doing this for years, and I can tell you, it's very hard. Now, I've got many honors, but there's one thing that's always left out when people introduce me. An amazing skill I have, and that's the ability to screw something up every day. I find I have the incredible ability on a daily basis to screw something up. And uh, the problem with this process is you get to look at it every day. Now, can everyone raise your hand? How many of you have impressed yourself with your incredible ability to screw something up on a daily basis? Yes, I'm, I'm not alone on this uh, screw up activity, right? <laughs> well, you get to look at it every day and it's very difficult to do. Now, it is very, very difficult to do. My friend Jim Moore would tell you this process saved his life. It didn't kind of save his life or sort of save his life, it did save his life. What was one of his daily questions? Are you currently updated on your physical examination? Are you currently updated on your physical examination? For the first 90 days he did this, he said no every day. After 90 days, he said, this is embarrassing. I've got to get the stupid exam or quit asking a question. So he got the stupid exam. The doctor said you had cancer. Now that was many, many years ago. He's going to be fine. The doctor also said, had you waited? seven more months, you would be dead. 
Well, he knew he should have gotten a physical exam. He was 65 years old. He was the chief learning officer of three multi-billion dollar companies. He knew he should have done it, but he didn't do it. When you hold a mirror in your face every day, you realize it's hard to hide. It's very hard to hide from all these things that we know we should do, but we actually don't do. Now, I was sharing this, all this with my daughter, Kelly. Uh, my daughter, Kelly, I'm very proud of her. I don't know how you've seen her before, but she uh, went to Duke University. She was a graduate. She was on the TV show Survivor Africa. So she was on the third season of Survivor. Which she gets to be on TV in front of 40 million people every week. And then after that, she went back. She got a PhD from Yale and two master's degrees. And now she's a professor at Vanderbilt. Has won lots of awards. So daddy's very proud. So Kelly and I are discussing this. And Kelly brought up an interesting point. I went to a program at the National Academy of Human Resources on employee engagement. And everything in employee engagement revolves around what Kelly defined as passive questions. Do you have clear goals? Do you have a best friend at work? Do you have meaningful work? All the employee engagement questions are pretty much passive questions. The problem with the passive question is when someone gives you a negative answer, they blame the environment. Do you have clear goals? No, why not? They're confused. Do you have meaningful work? No, no, no. They make me do trivia. Do you have a best friend? Well, no, they're all jerks. They're jerks. Not my fault. Them, 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 them. When I listen to this presentation on employee engagement, 100% of the responsibility for employee engagement was given to the company and 0% to the employee. What, it's not exaggeration. 100%, if the company does this, the employee will be engaged as if the employees have no brains and no responsibility in their own life. It's not an exaggeration, 100% company problem, 0% employee problem. I'm listening to this and I think, wait a minute, everything they said was good, yet they were missing half of an equation. John Kennedy, the famous president said, ask not what your country could do for you, ask what you could do for your country. Everything in employee engagement was the opposite of what John Kennedy said. It was 100% what's somebody gonna do for you and 0% what are you gonna do for anybody? So I listened to this and I thought, these people are missing a point. So my daughter Kelly taught me the value of something called active questions. Active questions. Now an active question begins with the phrase, did I do my best to? Did I do my best to in, in our study? Because if you ask that question, the responsibility is with you. The one thing I can't blame other people for is did I do my best? Now, our six questions, which I highly recommend all my clients use every day, and I'm going to come back to the LPR 50 process where we use this. Our six questions start with number one, did I do my best to set clear goals? So rather than say, did someone else set clear goals for me? Did I do my best to set clear goals myself? Now, in our LPR 50 group, which I'm going to talk about, these are some of the most distinguished people in the world. You would think they'd all get a 10 on this question. No. Sometimes they'll say, did I do my best to set clear goals? Average for the week, three, four, seven, six. Why? We get lost. Even the most successful leaders get lost. We wake up, you have a phone call, you do an email, you have another phone call, email. It's five o'clock. You look in the mirror, what, what happened? I guess my goal today was respond to emails and do a bunch of crap because that's all I did. So what happens is if we're not careful, we, we get taken over by the environment. So did I do my best to set clear goals every day? As simple as it sounds for many people, very challenging. Question number two, did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my goals? So rather than saying, did the company help me achieve my goals? Did I do my best to make progress toward achieving my own goals? Question number three, did I do my best to be happy? Now we're gonna spend a little bit of time, I'm gonna to talk to you all on this one. I'm gonna ask everybody to answer this question. Did I do my best to be happy? Now the question doesn't say, were you happy? The question says, did I do my best to be happy? In my book, Triggers, I talk about three medical doctors that I've coached. One is Dr. Jim Kim. 
Dr. Jim Kim is one of the smartest people I ever met. He has a simultaneous MD, medical degree, and PhD with honors from Harvard in five years. The average human being takes eight years to get a PhD from Harvard in, anthro in anthropology. He got a PhD from Harvard in anthropology with honors in five years and got a medical degree at the same time. So when the brains were passed out, my friend was not at the bottom of the list. Well, he also then went on to be the head of partners in health, president of Dartmouth College, and eventually became the president of the World Bank. Another one of the three doctors in triggers that I talk about, and again, I have the rights to use her name, is Dr. Ross Shaw. Dr. Ross Shaw was Indian American of the Year, formerly head of the United States Agency for International Development, and is now CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation. And the third medical doctor, and I talk about it, is Dr. John Millsworth, who is CEO of the Mayo Clinic, number one hospital in the world. So three brilliant people, I ask this question. On an average day, how would you score to answer this question? Did I do my best to be happy? All three, independently, not hearing the others, had the same answer. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. We were all too busy achieving things to try to be happy. Well, they're all medical doctors. So I asked him a question, did it dawn on you that you're going to die? Do they teach that in medical school, their death? They said, oh yeah, yeah, they, they covered that in medical school, yeah. Death, yeah, they covered that topic. I said, do you think this is a silly question or a trivial question? He said, no, it's a very important question. I just forgot to ask, I was too busy. In my book, Triggers, my favorite line in the whole book is this. Sometimes even the greatest sharpshooter can miss a very big target. Sometimes even the greatest sharpshooter can miss a very big target. In terms of brains, these people were about as smart as you're gonna get. And every day they forgot to try to be happy. Okay, I'm gonna ask everybody right now, and Kate, if you can read the answers, and not all of them, but just as they scream in, one to 10 scale, 10 is high and one is low. On an average day, how would you score an answer to this question? Did I do my best to be happy today? Write down a number and put it in the chat box. All right, we're getting everything from nine to one, and everything in between. I'm seeing mostly sevens and eights. Wide range, yeah, three, four, seven, three, three, five. The average in the world is about a 5.5. The average in the world is about a 5.5. Now, did anybody raise your hand score approximately, a, say, a, somewhere between four and six? Yeah, okay, so many of you scored in that area. Uh, yeah, between four and a six, yeah. Raise your hand again. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, let's call on Debbie. Debbie, uh, what did you study in school? Uh, can, can Kate, can Debbie talk? Yeah, Debbie, go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. So Debbie, what did you study in school? Uh, business. Business, and did you have to take lots of tests? Yes. If you got a five out of 10, would you be proud of that score or ashamed of that score? I would not. I always wanted to get the 10. <laughs> well, the, the, test, the test you just got a five on was more important than every test you ever took in college. You cut out, Marshall. I'm sorry. The test that you just got a five out of 10 on is more important than any test you ever took in college. No, I know that. I believe that. So thank you. Let's hear it for Debbie. Yay for Debbie. <laughs> okay, so Debbie, raise the score. So all of you that got those lower scores, Ray, raise the score. Now, the fourth question is, did I do my best to find meaning? Rather than saying, did the company give me meaningful work, did I do my best to find meaning, to create meaning in my job myself? Question number five, did I do my best to build positive relationships? Rather than just saying, did, did the company, do I have a best friend? Was I a friend? And finally, question six, did I do my best to be fully engaged? Rather than saying, did the company engage me? Did I do my best to engage myself? Now, 
we've done a survey with people where they have to, we have thousands of people in our surveys and we have them evaluate themselves every day on these six questions. What have we learned? And I'll send everyone a copy of the research article if you'd like to see it. 34% of the people that do this every day say they feel better at everything, happier, more meaningful. 67% said they got better at four items out of six. 91% said they got better at something. And 9% said they stayed about the same and virtually nobody said they got worse. Why every day these questions get us to focus on the one thing in life we can control. Did I do my best? For those of you who are on the call who are Hindus, what is it? one of the first things you learn in the Gita? What you learn in the Bhagavad Gita is pretty simple. You don't get fixated on the outcomes. You assess the situation, you make peace with what is and you do your best. Well, these questions really get you focused on, did I do my best too? So that's the daily question process. And in my clients now, I try to have them do this every day. So every day they write down this series of questions. Okay. Now there's one question, only one question every day I get a perfect score on. Did I do my best to declare victory today? Did I do my best to declare victory today? 10. So every day in life, I try to declare victory. Everyone on this call, we have so many blessings. So, you know, there are always more people in the world that have more problems than we do. So I think it's good every day just to declare victory and say, overall, I'm declaring victory with life here. So anyway, that's kind of the daily question process. You can write any questions you want. Now, I want everybody just to put in the chat box, What's one question you should challenge yourself with every day? Just write down one question and put it in the chat box. One question you should write for yourself every day. Did I serve someone today? Did I market myself today? Did I do my best to have gratitude? Do I listen well? That's one of my questions. Have I prospected? Did I laugh? Uh, was I a good wife or husband? Uh, Interesting, several people talked about marketing. We're gonna talk about that later. Did I add value to people? Was I kind? Was I thankful? Now, the important point of the exercise is no one can write your questions for you. The key is you write your own questions because if they come from your heart, you're much more likely to do them. So that's the daily question process. Now I'm gonna combine that with something else that I've learned from my friend, Alan Mulally. Of all the people that I coach, the person that probably improved the most is my friend, Alan Mulally. Alan was the CEO of the year in the United States. He was a CEO of Ford. The stock went from $1.01 when he was there to $18.40. Uh, the stock went up 1,837% when he was CEO. Even more impressive, he had a 97% approval rating from every employee in a union company. The United Auto Workers, they usually hate CEOs. They love this guy, 97% approval rating from union employees. Well, Alan Wally is an amazing man. Of all the people I coached, I spent the least amount of time with him and he improved the most. Well, I go to Alan and I said, Alan, well, I don't get paid if you don't get better, not as judged by me, but all your stakeholders. Of all the people I coach, you improve the most that I spent the least amount of time with you. So I made a chart. I said, Alan, I got a chart here. One to mention is time spent with a coach Marshall Goldsmith and the other is improvement. There seems to be a negative correlation between spending time with me and getting better. So I said, Alan, the way this chart looks, had I never met you, you'd be really good. <laughs> so what should I learn about coaching from you? And he taught me a great lesson. He said, the biggest challenge of a coach is customer selection. He said, your stakeholder coaching process, if you have the right customers, it always works. You're the wrong customer, it never works. So you have to just have the great customers you win, you have bad customers you lose. Well, that was a great learning for me. Don't make coaching about your ego and how great you think you are. Make it about your clients, how much you love them and how hard they work. So then Alan described his leadership process to me called the business plan review. And again, I've got an article about it, which I can send if you'd like to see the article. He goes to Ford, the stock is, down to one dollar and one cent. They're losing seventeen billion dollars. So he says to all the employees, "I want you to give me your top five priorities: red, yellow, green. Red, yellow, green. 
green is I'm on plan, yellow is I'm not on plan, but I have a strategy, and red is I'm not on plan, but no strategy. Red, yellow, green, and we'll see you know, what's going well and what isn't. So the first meeting, he has 16 employees, 16 direct reports, and he has five priorities, 80 priorities. The company's losing $17 billion, $17 billion they're losing. So the first meeting, okay, red, yellow, green, 80 green. Everything's green. Everyone says we're on plan. They're losing $17 billion, all on plan. So Ellen goes, well, uh, wait, he said, we're losing $17 billion and we're all on plan. Our plan must be to lose $17 billion. This is a bad plan, bad plan, bad plan. Let's do it again. Finally, someone says red. Ellen stands up and applauds. He says, thank you for having the courage to say red. Then he said something I've almost never heard a CEO say. He said, you're not on plan and you don't know how to get there. It's okay. It's okay. He said, I'm going to show you one thing. I'm the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. I know much less than you do. And that's okay too. The reality is you have a problem. The other reality is probably no one sitting in this room even has a clue on how to solve the problem. And we've got a lot of smart young engineers in this company. Why don't we actually go find some people who know what they're talking about and try to solve the problem rather than pretend we know what we're doing? Ten minutes to put it with about 75 people who've done this. And the results on this have been incredibly positive. Linda Sharkey, you've been a member of one of these groups. Can you just take a second and talk? First, let me introduce Linda. Linda has been the head of leadership development and executive development or talent or chief learning officer for several different large corporations and just has been a great advocate of stakeholder center leadership. And, and she actually has applied this internally in large companies with huge success. So Linda, can you talk about your experience in the LPR process? Yeah, I can, Marshall. It was a great process. We uh, everybody yellow green then we talked about why uh, something might be red or why something might be green uh, yellow and then we actually gave each other some coaching and some suggestions and it became quite a bonding experience and our facilitator who you know well Marshall uh, Eddie Turner was just terrific it, it became a really facilitated dialogue that built a lot of camaraderie and trust among the five of us. And in fact, we're still continuing on. I think September 9th, we're having our, uh, our next meeting, but it was extremely powerful. And when you look at the dashboard, it was really clear what was important to people and the things that were important, they really did work on and they really did improve. We Thank loved you. it. Thank you, Linda. Let's hear it for Linda. Thank you, Linda. And you know, one phrase that somebody mentioned about this process is called uh, accountability without judgment. And people love accountability. It don't like the judgment that comes with it, feeling judged and you're bad and you should be ashamed and all that crap. So what you get in this process is really the goal is to have accountability yet don't have judgment where people feel bad and put down because we all fail every week at something. Now, I'm going to describe a second process, then we'll get to our other questions. The second process is called the LPR 50 process. Similar, yet a little bit different. In the LPR 50, I put together a group of 50 amazing people from different walks of life. And I'll tell you who some of them are. One of them is my friend, Dr. Jim Kim, who was president of the World Bank. One of them was, let me mention, Dr. Ra Shaw, head of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, one of them, Ashish Shivani. Ashish Shivani. Kate, can you hit the mute? Yeah. One of them is Ashish Shivani, who was head of junior achievement. We had uh, the woman who's in charge of the U.S. Olympic Committee. We had uh, Pau Gasol, famous basketball player from Spain. We had uh, Curtis Martin, who's in the National Football League Hall of Fame, number five rusher in NFL history. We had uh, Telly Leung, who's a Broadway star. So we got Broadway stars, athletes, head of World Bank, CEO of Cardinal Health, all these amazing people. And every week we did the six questions in this LPR format, where I actually had them go through the six questions every week. Now we did something that was a little different. 
Linda's process really is great for team building and bonding. Because what you do is you develop very good relationships. The LPR 50 process is quite different. We had six meetings a week for the last 10 weeks. So I spent 60 hours on this over the last 10 weeks. They had a choice of which, we, which hour to pick. Because you got to realize these people are so busy that if you just give them one block, it's very hard for them. So we gave them six choices. They picked one of the six hours and they were in rotating groups. So they made a totally different group every week. The other rules we had are in Linda's group, they had things on screen that you could see, the red, yellow, green. In this group, we have nothing on screen. The reason is if you're a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, you can't have anything online that someone could take a picture of. You can't do that anymore. So there's nothing on the screen. All they did is have a verbal discussion and it went like this. I'd say, let's say Willem. I'd say, you know, Willem, um, let's begin with your six questions. And they go through each question, they give themselves a score, they talk a little bit about what happened during the week. Then each person has three questions they pick for themselves and they talk about those. Then I'd say, what are you proud of and what you learn? We did this over and over every week. Every session lasts about an hour and the people loved it. The people just loved it for a variety of reasons. And I'm following up to say why. One is they had no one to talk to. The higher up you are, the lonelier it is. You, you know the old saying, it's lonely at the top. It's lonelier at the top today. Given social media, uh, in the United States, especially with all of the you know, Me Too issues, racial issues, you can't say anything to anybody about anything. It's very lonely at the top. So they really love being a group of people they could talk with, number one. Number two, again, they had accountability. And just like us, they're human beings. Even though they're hyper achievers, they still have the same issues. And the other thing they learn are their common humanity. I mean, we had one very moving session where a woman is on the, only one woman, there are equal number of women and men in the group, by the way, incredible diversity. But in one session, just randomly, there's only one woman and six men. And two of them, men, their mother had died. And they talked about how much their mothers had meant to them and how meaningful that was. And this, she's the only woman who was a mother and had two boys. She's going, she's just start crying. She said, oh my God, you know, if my son talks about me that way, I would be so proud. So it was very touching because people get to be humans. And the one thing that's missing in all those jobs is you don't get to be a human being. You don't get to be human. You have to play this role. It's not good or bad, it just is. You have to play this role. And they really realize when they're in these groups that even in this diverse group of hyper-achieving people, we're all just humans. You know, two people had kids with brain tumors. Well, it doesn't matter how fancy your job title is. It hurts. So they got to really experience life. So that process is called the LPR 50. So anyway, if any of you are interested, I'll try to keep you appraised as to how these processes are working. This is all being developed as we go. Um, and maybe we have time for not a lot of questions, but a couple of questions about the process. So uh, Kate, if you can translate questions about the, the process. Yes, yeah, very simple. You can see the daily questions are excellent preparation for the weekly LPR. So at the end of the week, I would ask people, um, did you do your best to set clear goals? They would give me a number. And that number was typically based on the scores they'd gotten on a daily basis. So that is the connection between the LPR, which is for them an individual process, the LPR, which was a team process, and the daily questions, which were an individual process. Very good question, thank you. Okay, you got another question? The LPR is not designed to improve organizational development. The LPR is designed for an individual. Alan's process is called the BPR process, which I didn't go into great detail. That process is parallel though. 
And it's what he used to turn around Boeing and to turn around Ford when they had disasters. So a slightly different process. If you'd like to know how that works, I'd recommend a book. The name of the book is called American Icon, A-M-E-R-I-C-A, an American Icon, I-C-O-N. And it's about how Alan turned around Ford. Very good question. Okay, Kate? Uh, you know, the first groups are just randomly formed. Uh, Linda and I went to a program. Linda, you know more than I did. I forgot. It was pretty random, wasn't it, Linda? It was random, yeah. We turned our names in when we were all out in uh, San Diego. And I think Scott um, just put the groups together. But um, it, I think, in my own experience in talking to my group, you could do it with a group of executives who know each other. Or you could do it with a random group of people that just want to get better. Um, I don't know that it necessarily matters. It, it matters more what you're trying to accomplish, I think. You know, and a very good question. Back to that, who's in the group? When it didn't work from the people in Los Angeles, some of the people in the group just didn't like each other. Right, right. And that doesn't work. I mean, if you don't like somebody, you see them week after week after week, you like them less. <laughs> so your distaste turns to hate very quickly, right? So that, that didn't work. So here's the difference between the LPR model and the LPR 50 model. The LPR model really is much deeper about personal bonding and team bonding. Right. The, L, the LPR 50 model, you don't know who's going to be in your group every week. You might have never seen these people before. So every week it's different. The disadvantage is you don't have this personal bonding, but let me give you the advantages of the LPR 50 model for the people I work with. Number one, if they can't show up, no one knows the difference. See, nobody knows who's gonna be in your team every week. So there's not this embarrassment of, oh my God, Jimmy didn't make it this week and this is two weeks in a row and uh, the world's coming to an end. Doesn't Jimmy like us? Well, nobody knows. Nobody knows who's gonna be in your group anyway. So it, there isn't this kind of embarrassment. And the other advantage with executives is they have six choices. So if they actually miss their meeting, they've got five more chances to schedule it. So it's, it, by the way, it's not good or bad, it's just different. The original LPR model that Linda went through, better if you like the people and you wanna have deeper bonding. The other one's great if you wanna to get to meet a lot of people. One of the ideas I have on that one is especially into, especially important in the US is diversity. You could put together, for example, if you want to develop women leaders, get a top woman leader from 10 different companies or six different companies or eight and put them in the same LPR group, or even get 50 and do it like the LPR 50, where then they get to meet other women from 50 different organizations over time. So we're just experimenting with this stuff, but these are just some of the ideas. Good. So again, thank you, Kate. Let's hear it. Thanks to Kate for setting all this up. Kate, yay for Kate, yay. Now, let me stop there. Now I'm going to deal with more. And I, what I want to do is have more of these kind of regular calls where I just keep you guys updated on new stuff I'm working on. And again, these are strictly voluntary. If you want to come, you can. If you don't want to, it's okay. I'll try to schedule them one in the morning and one in the evening. So that way you have two choices in terms of schedule and we're gonna record them. So if you just wanna to listen to the record or the, uh, the archive, you can listen to the archive as well. So that was one of the decisions that I made. Now, in terms of the administrative stuff, let me give you the concerns I've heard or the questions I've heard, and then I'll turn it over to Frank or Brandon to deal with any questions you have. Some of the people said, oh, what's a connection with the the stakeholders that are coaching in SCG, Will's new organization, the answer is there's no business relationship at all. So Will just used to work for us and he doesn't work there anymore. So there is no relationship. And then somebody said, well, should I learn about this new thing? If you want to, I mean, to me, you should learn about anything you want. You could be certified as a stakeholder center coach and many of you are an LPR coach or listening coach or all kinds of other coaches too. That's fine with me. There's no, uh, no, uh, copyright on learning. So learn as much as you want to learn from whoever you want to learn from. There was an issue with the website because Will had access to the old website. So stuff all got funneled back to his new site. 
And again, we're going to work on that. It'll, it'll take maybe a week or two, but eventually we'll have a new website and everything that was on the old website will be on the new website. So that should get all squared out, but it may take a week or two. So accept my apologies for any confusion that call. Some people uh, were wondering, gee, I'm paying money on this installment basis for something or other, which I, I didn't know what this was because I haven't kept track of any of this stuff. And just finish doing whatever you're doing and I'll make sure that everybody gets credit for whatever you need to get credit for. And if you have any problems, just ask me personally, uh, since I signed the certificates anyway, I think I can take care of that. So I'll make sure that everybody gets whatever they need to get. Uh, and if, does anybody else, any questions people might have like uh, about the, uh, the stakeholder coaching moving forward? Oh yeah, one other idea. The other thing I like is um, people are interested in a leadership role because I kind of see this as a blessing in disguise. So people are interested in a leadership role, let me know because Will did kind of run things, which is not a bad thing. He did, I think, a pretty good job. On the other hand, Jonathan, you might want to play a leadership role where you are, or Catherine, you might want to play a leadership role where you are, or some of you might like to say, I'd like to, I'd like to decentral at Carlos, for example. You know, you might want to say, I really want to be in charge of this for Peru. Well, there's no reason you couldn't do that. So what I'd really like to do is decentralize this. So rather than one person being in charge of quote international, which is a very vague, broad term, we really have this decentralized. So different ones of you are responsible for different things. Um, and again, somebody said, what does a leadership role imply? I don't know. <laughs> Any of you that know me, I just make stuff up as I go, so I don't know. Now, the next question is the Global 360. I wrote the Global 360. So I think I have the rights to use the Global 360 since I did write it and develop it. Yeah, that is going to be available for everybody. We're just working right now on how to transition that out. So everyone is going to have access to the Global 360 just like they did before. Um, and again, many of you would like to volunteer for a leadership role. Why don't we do this? Everyone who's interested in a leadership role, we'll do another one of these calls. And on the call, we'll talk about it. And you have to realize this is kind of an evolutionary process. So there's not some cookie cutter answer out there. We'll just talk about it. And then we'll say, all right, how could people be in a leadership role? So like Carlos, you could be in charge of Peru or uh, somebody could be in charge of UK somebody can be in charge of that. And then in a big country like India, like Himanshu, we might need multiple people to be in a leadership role because we have so many people in India who are involved in the process. You might want to break it up to maybe the big areas or regions or whatever. So we don't have any answers there. Himanshu, any thoughts you might have on that? Not now at this point of time, Marshall, I'll write to you. Okay. But I like your process uh, being a bigger country. We could have a decentralized multilateral approach. I like yeah. the idea. Yeah, I like it too. Let me tell you something else I'm working on, which is a little bit, I don't want to confuse things too much, but it's, it is kind of connected to this. As I've grown older... Can I say something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, Marshall, uh, what I found that your GLA 360 is basically based on Europe and USA based on... Uh, I, I think that uh, India specific something uh, should be there. You visited Great. several times India and yes. we need something very special for India, you know, uh, and it will be helpful for us. This is very good. Now I've got an idea for you. Okay. Are you ready? Dr. J. I love that name, Dr. J. So are you ready, Dr. J? Now, this ties directly into what I was going to discuss next anyway. So as I've grown older, uh, what I really want to do is impact as many people as I can in a positive way in the limited time I have left to do it. Now, Dr. J, I was having a talk with a woman named Nankande. Nankande is from Africa and she was in our LPR 50 group. And Nankande said, she, I'd love to use your material in Africa. I said, well, look, I'll give it to you. Just use it in Africa, right? She's not a certified coach necessarily, but she can use it in training or helping poor people or whatever she wants to. She said, yeah, there's a problem. You know, you're an old white guy. And if you're from Africa, the concept of, oh, here I'm an old white man here to help you. 
And somehow people get just a little skeptical. <laughs> I can't understand why. <laughs> they get just a little skeptical about old white man here to help you Africans, right? A little skeptical about that one. <laughs> I thought it makes a lot of sense. So Nankandi and I were talking and we came up with a great idea. I said, do it yourself. You put together your own training materials and rewrite them in a way that's good for your culture. Now, if you need my support, you can say, with Marshall Goldsmith. With Marshall Goldsmith. That way, you see, I'm not in a primary role, I'm in a secondary role. So Dr. J, if you wanna develop something for India, what I'd really do is rather than me having to become an expert on India, which I'm not, I've been there 40 times, but I'm not an expert. You and some people put together a great thing for India. If you need my support, I would say Dr. J with Marshall Goldsmith. Therefore, I'm in a secondary role. You're the leader of the project. Like Carlos, you wanted to say leadership in Peru. You'd write a little article or a book or whatever and say, Carlos, and if you wanted to use my stuff, you just say with Marshall Goldsmith. So right now, this is a very exciting idea. They're yeah, all it's really things. exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. Thank you so much. I'll write to you. All right, Dr. J. Let's hear it from Dr. J. Hey. So I'm very excited about this idea. And we already have four books being made about this, where people are already doing four books. And it's I can't do and Marshall Goldsmith, there's a subtle distinction. So I can't be a major author because I have a million dollar advance on my next book. So I can't just sit there and be co-author of 50 other books. On the other hand, if you say with Marshall Goldsmith, and it's just a subtle distinction, but your name is a big name and my name is a small name. But that way it's obvious I'm supportive, yet I'm not taking credit. You're using my stuff, you're not stealing anything, you're giving me credit, but I'm not taking credit. Let me give you a positive example. I just did a book with Sally Helgeson called How Women Rise. The book has been remarkably successful. Great feedback, made lots, thank you, made lots of money. Sally made a million dollars giving speeches last year about that book alone. Big success. I was in a secondary role in the book. Much better for me. I'm not a woman, I'm not an expert on women. Who's some old white man sitting there talking about how women are supposed to act? Very bad. On the other hand, me being a supportive to her was very good. I wasn't seen as a know-it-all. I wasn't the primary author. I wasn't seen as this. And it's not like me telling the world all the answers. She was a major author and I was supported to her. Fantastic. It, that one worked out. That one actually wasn't and. I can't do another one like that, but I can do a with just because of publishing distinctions. And then somebody brought up the issue of money. So let's say, Dr. let's say Carlos, you do something for Peru and you make money. Okay, I'm gonna keep the money thing real simple. I've got a charity, donate anything you want to to charity. And if you want to donate something great, you don't want to donate anything great. Look, I'm giving all my, my materials away to help you as much as I can anyway. So any of this stuff you can use, just use it. So if you want to use it and you feel like, gee, we should pay somebody, just write a check to the charity and I'll donate it to the nonprofit pay it forward charity. That's strictly optional though. So the idea is you do whatever you want. That way there's not a whole lot of administrative hassle there. So Dr. J, you do a project, you make money. If you want to donate something to the charity, you do. If you don't, you don't. I don't care. I'll never know the difference anyway. So I never keep track of any accounting things or any of that stuff anyway, so I'll never know the difference. So just do whatever you want to do. Does this make sense to everybody? Very good, very good, very good. So let's see. Now, do we have any other questions? Can people just, Kate, do you have other questions people might have? Okay. Yeah, I know several interested in leadership. I see that in the questions. And so, you know, what we'll do, Kate, is our next meeting will be about what people are interested in providing a leadership role. Okay, why don't we do that? And then also, 
I'm going to have, there's really two different issues. One is a leadership role in terms of leading the kind of the broader stakeholder coaching thing. The second though would be more like, I want to work on a project like Dr. J said. He thinks you should do this for India specifically, but well, great, but I don't know enough to do this for India. So who would like to play more of a thought leadership role? So two kinds of leadership. One leadership would be more of an administrative leadership role, but another is a thought leadership role. While we're brainstorming, let me give you a couple of ideas. One woman in our 100 coach group is uh, Julie Carrier. So she's gonna use all my stuff for helping young women and girls. So she wants to write stuff for young women and girls, yet she wants to modify my material. So that's fine. So she, you know, Julie Carrier with Marshall. She wants to do it with young women and girls. Uh, in terms of not so much, she doesn't want to lead stakeholder coaching, but she wants to work on thought leadership as my friend Gabriela Teasdale. Gabriela is from Paraguay. And Gabriela wants to work on translating everything into Spanish. So, you know, Carlos, you can interface with her. She wants to work on translating all the materials to Spanish and she wants to do some writing as well. So again, the idea on this material thing is as a coach, I think you're probably gonna have more credibility like Walt if the material says Walt with Marshall as opposed to Walt just using Marshall's materials. So this way you can make it be what you need it to be for your clients. So I look at this as kind of a reverse franchise model. The typical franchise model is there is a brand and you have to follow exact steps and you have to pay money to use the brand and you have to repeat it over and over and all the credit goes to the franchisor. So the idea behind this is kind of the opposite. Um, you're the brand, this stuff is for you. You use it in a way you want to. And then you say, these people helped, but the primary credit goes to you. So I like the model better because I think it's gonna be better for you as a coach to build your own credibility. I mean, ultimately I used to work for Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard and I left and started my own business. Like I said, I think it's fine that Will leaves and starts his own business, that's healthy. Right? I did the same thing. I'm certainly not judging anybody else. That's perfectly okay. So the idea is to me, develop people and use any of my stuff that you can use. And then if you can use that to go out on your own and do your own business in your own way, that's great. And, and if I can help you, that would be good. Now, my friend from Thailand, I know Kara would like to lead this process in Thailand. And you know, so we've got people in different countries. Uh, who might like to lead. And maybe Himancho, you could be a leader in India. Car could be a leader in Thailand or Energy can work with Himancho in India. So we've got, yeah, so we've got several different people here who already in various degrees of leadership roles. So let me, uh, and you know, and then, uh, you know, like I say, Dr. J, I love your idea about developing something for India because I think you know, that's really very positive. So let's see what time it is. We're doing pretty good. We got a couple of minutes. Um, so Kate, do I have any other questions from people? Let's just say, let's just take one at a time, okay? What's the, yes, the, uh, as of now, especially for someone who's been actively using it and they have clients, just continue to use Will's system to do the scoring. Um, we are in process. In fact, I've been just working, one of these I've been working on is the spec sheets for some new software and, that, and by the way, in, you know, in, in the United States, we've always called it the mini survey. And, and so if you hear the word mini survey or LGPR, you're roughly talking the same thing. This is the feedback that the leader gets about their improvement in the goal they've been working on from their stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working on a new system that's going to be very similar to the LGPR in some regards, but very different. It's going to be, what's different is much more flexibility 
in terms of, for instance, how many surveys you do and, and those kinds of things. So once we have that up and running, um, especially if you're working on, you know, your, you know, your higher levels of certification, you'll be using ours. But just for now, just keep using wills and, and, and everything is good. Okay, good. Kate, any other questions? Well, just, you know, just, I want to make two quick um, announcements. One of them is, you know, Marshall and I have known Brian Underhill for 25 years, and he, over time, has built the largest coach company, coaching services company in the world. And we are forming a much closer re business relationship with him. And, and so he'll be representing us, um, you know, pretty much across the world in terms of, of, a, of a major place to go for coaches. And for anyone who's one of our certified coaches, um, you don't get to be part of Coach Source just because you've done that. I mean, they have a very high standard in terms of, of being a full-time coach and, and having a number of years of experience, those kinds of things. But he, they will be looking to give preference to our coaches. So that's just one announcement. And the second announcement is, is Brian. Brian, Brian. Can we stop for a second? Is Brian on the call, Okay. I don't think Brian could make this this one. He okay. Yeah, this this is very exciting because we're going to merge with my, Brian was an intern of mine when he was a kid, so I've known Brian since he was in his twenties. So he's a good friend. He's got the world's largest coaching referral network. So we're gonna he's going to work with us to do referrals for stakeholder centered coaches. So that's something that's very positive that Brian is doing in Coach Source. And then Frank, what's the next topic? But just the other one is, you know, Marsha, you know this, we've had talks, Marsha and I have had talks that, where are the, you know, you can talk about, you know, women are underrepresented, we've got to do stuff about that. Also, young people are underrepresented. Marsha, we've been talking about, where are the guys like we were when we were 28 years old and doing the phenomenal stuff we had the opportunity to do? And, and so, and I'm sure some of you may have been thinking, well, okay, Will is gone, who's going to, replace him, not in the same way that Will ran the business, but we, so we decided to pick someone half our age who also has the most knowledge about what was going on in Will's organization. And so Brandon Murgard is going to be our overall coordinator with our new larger leadership team, um, you know, so that everyone can make it easy for people to serve our clients. So we are so happy that we were fortunate enough to land Brandon. That's it. It's time, time's up. Well, anyway, thanks to everybody. I'm looking forward to getting to, I, some things are a blessing in disguise. And, and I wanna build on what Frank said. This, don't feel bad using all of this stuff as kind of a springboard in your career. Like uh, the Dr. Jace could comment. If I can help you, and then eventually you can leverage that into you know, bigger and better things, that's great. So the goal for, for me, for you, is that ultimately you're in the same role I am and you're doing this call, and there's a lot of nice people you're trying to help, and, and that you're, yet you're doing it in your own way. So the way that you can use this stuff for yourself is, is so much the better. And again, I'm always a great debt to Peter Drucker and Paul Hersey and all the people that helped me. So if I can help any of you in that same way, just please let me know, because that's my goal. So finally, it's been a joy to talk to all of you. We've got to have work calls coming up. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Bye bye. You're the best, Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall and team. Thank you. Marshall. Life is good. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Marshall. Bye bye, Marshall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marshall. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Brent. Marshall. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you, Kate. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Glad to meet you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.
Thank bye. you, Marshall. Bye, Marshall. Thank bye you. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Bye, bye, bye. Namaste. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Marshall. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye, bye. See you guys. Bye, bye. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you so much. Thanks.